Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. Just before the uh, COP climate conference, there was an IPSO survey that asked people um, about their expectations for the future. And what was very surprising is that there were very, very many people who thought that at some point in the future they would lose their homes. And if you extrapolate the IPSO poll to the world, basically it indicates 2 billion people are prepared to lose their homes. So let's look at that. I'll look at the um, article. I'll look a bit at the uh, IPSO survey itself, some of the questions on it and results. And then we'll look at um, how, um, basically we'll look at ways that you can um, make your home a bit more climate proof, how you can better prepare for climate disasters that hit your area. And this is directly from one of the campfire um, California uh, wild people who lost their um, their house to the wildfires and, and almost lost their lives. Luckily they got out. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, what was going on. And this Ipso poll was done um, just before the COP uh, climate conference. So let's have a look here. Okay, so this is the article. So how do they come up with this number? Billions of people are expected to be displaced within the next 25 years because of severe impacts from climate change. So some areas of the world are obviously more at risk. The study by Ipsos revealed that nearly four in 10 people believe they will lose their homes from impacts associated with climate change. So they published this study just days before the COP28 climate conference. They surveyed 24,220 adults across 31 countries from September 22nd to October 6th, 2023, just to get a feel for how people feel across the globe about climate change. 38% of the survey takers said that it's unlikely they'll do, be displaced in the next 25 years. No, 38% of the survey takers said that it's likely they'll be displaced, displaced in the next 25 years from the impacts of climate change. Although the number leaps for areas like Turkey, Brazil, and India, so where the numbers were 68% in Turkey, 61% in Brazil, and 57% in India. So these are regions that are already being hit harder by climate change than other regions, so people are more pessimistic on the future. The results from each of the 31 countries equate to more than 2 billion people around the globe. So they do a big extrapolation here to get that number and to get a, a jazzy headline. The US ranks below average for the concerns about displacement with 35% of Americans believing they'd lose their homes because of climate change. Residents in the Netherlands were the least concerned, and that's not too surprising because they have flooding. Lots of the Netherlands is below sea level, and uh, they've been living with the threats of rising seas for a long, long time, and their engineers are very smart, and so far they've managed to protect themselves. So. So they're not concerned. They're the least bit concerned about losing their homes. Maybe they're in one of the highest risk regions, but the people are the least concerned. Only 19% of respondents think they'll be displaced, but still it's one in five roughly. Okay, so this is a stark reality um, about people's views on climate change. It, the stark reality is that the majority of people are not only witnessing the severe impacts of climate change, but they're bracing for its escalation, according to the IPSO's chief sustainability officer. So a staggering seven in 10 people expect climate change will profoundly affect their local areas within the next decade. And this is really out of tune to what governments are doing and what uh, politicians are doing and uh, you know, the way the way our society is going. Of the people surveyed, 57% claim to have already witnessed a severe impact of climate change where they live. Of course, much higher numbers that are being severely hit. So this year, Brazil battled an unprecedented drought. 
Mexico was hit by several devastating hurricanes, including Hurricane Otis, which intensified in record time, as I discussed in the last uh, video. Turkey was hit by a horrific earthquake. You know, not it's not climate change, but still, you know, uh, affecting people, kill, killing thousands. About 60% of survey takers felt that businesses in their countries weren't doing enough to combat climate change. Similar numbers reported they felt their governments weren't providing enough information about how to combat climate change. Okay, so that's the article. So let's have a look at um, another. This is another article. This talk. This is the Ipso, basically. Okay, so this is the Ipso.com. The survey people that did the survey. So this is uh, some more details on on their survey. So seven in 10 people anticipate that climate change will have a severe effect in their area within the next 10 years. Six in 10 say their government's not working hard enough to tackle climate change. Okay, so the key findings are the 57% of people across 31 countries have already witnessed a severe impact of climate change where they live. For countries like Mexico, Brazil, and Turkey, this figure is as high as 8, 8 in 10, 80%. 38% say it's unlikely that within the next 25 years, again, it's not unlikely. 38% say it's likely that within the next 25 years, they will be displaced from their home due to the effects of climate change. It's over a third. 6 in 10 say their government's not providing enough information about how they can make better choices on how to tackle climate change. 63% are critical of their government's efforts to keep them up to date on the potential impacts. Broadly speaking, people believe that the media underestimates the impact of climate change. 42% think that. There are 23% who say that the media exaggerates the effects of climate change. Those are the climate deniers, of course. Criticism is not confined to government and the media. 59% say businesses in their country are not working hard enough to tackle climate change. 71% say that they're using environmental claims without committing to real change. So they're greenwashing. Okay, so the stark reality, reality is that the majority of people are not only witnessing the severe impacts of climate change now, but they're bracing for the escalation of the impacts of climate change. And seven in 10 expect climate change will profoundly affect their local areas just within the next decade. So there's a critical disconnect. There's a pervasive sentiment, sentiment that both governments and businesses are not matching the public's concerns with equivalent levels of action and transparency. Okay, so let's look, these are some of the survey results across uh, different countries. So the question is, how severe an effect would you say climate change has had so far in the area where you live? And the percentage of severity, global country average is 57%, well over half. Highest is Mexico, 81%, Brazil, 79%, Turkey, 79%, as I've already mentioned. And you can look at these other countries Japan 66, um, Canada's 54, about half. Um, you know, we had all these wildfires in the summer that probably really jacked up that number. China's half. The U.S. is, is, is just under half, 46%. You know, people in these countries um, are less concerned. New Zealand, Netherlands, Ireland, Malaysia, Great Britain, and Sweden. Well, Great Britain's getting a massive storm right now, so that number may, would, maybe would come higher. Now, these numbers tend to come higher, tend to have a lot of dependency on what events have happened in the country recently. Sweden is the lowest. Now, looking ahead, here's another question. How well or not do you feel your government keeps you informed about the potential impacts of climate change in your region country? Global, globally, it's about less than a third think their government's doing a good, good job at informing people about the impacts of climate change. 52% not well, 11% not at all globally. So, that, so China, interestingly, is the highest. 62% of the people surveyed in China say their government is keeping them informed in a good fashion on the potential impacts of climate change. 32%, a third, not well. 
very few, not at all, right? Most of them answered the survey. <laughs> um, well, not at all. They think the government is doing something, I guess. Um, and then you can go down, you can look at your countries. I mean, no country is doing very well. Um, it, Canada, you know, yeah, the Canadian government's useless on informing people about climate change. They're next to useless. So I agree with the 26% number um, are saying, well, not well is, um, you know, much higher, 55%, and then 10%, not at all. Um, and uh, so you can look at different countries down there. Interestingly, the Canada numbers are lower than the U.S. numbers, although the 14% is pretty large here. You know, Turkey thinks the government's doing a useless job, and that's one of the hardest hit countries. Okay, so taking action on climate change. How hard do you think the government, businesses, and citizens in your country is working to tackle climate change? So, you know, very or fairly hard. The government, businesses, and citizens uh, say, you know, 34%, but one in three. Not hard enough is more like the two-thirds, almost 60%. Okay, so interesting study, and it was done just before COP, so the results would go out at COP. So let's continue. Um, so climate change is happening. Why do so many of us still act like it's not? So this is part of the psychology of why people don't act, even though they think um, things are getting worse and worse. I mean, climate researchers initially assumed that if you gave people the right information, we would act on it, but they found out quickly that this is not the case. Most people would rather just sweep our burning planet under the rug, you know, and ignore it. So this is from The Conversation, which is an Australian publication. I think it was originally in Conversation, and then Fast Company picked it up. So... Australian angle. So climate fuel disasters now front page news as record breaking floods, fires, droughts and storms keep arriving. The damage done is systemic and pervasive, resonating through our communities, economies and environment. It manifests in many ways from empty spaces and supermarket shells to houses left unlivable after floods, anxious communities collapsing ecosystems and emergency services stretched to capacity. Okay, so climate researchers initially assumed that if you gave people the right information, we'd act on it. Burning fossil fuels comes with severe consequences, so let's phase out fossil fuels. But this is not the case. For many people, this information triggered cognitive dissonance, where they knew climate change was happening, but they acted like it wasn't. Many people, of course, still smoke, even though they know it's bad for their health. This is huge cognitive dissonance. Many of us, I guess many in Australia, fly to Italy, <laughs> even though we know how many extra tons of CO2 we put into the atmosphere. So, I mean, change seems hard. Doing nothing is pretty easy because public and private narratives that we've grown up with are culture. Our expectations of life are geared toward wanting comfort and stability, right? People um, actually, um, you know, when people talk about happiness, what's important for happiness, comfort and stability is probably the most important thing. People want to feel that they're okay, that they'll be okay. Um, so not everybody has developed the ways of thinking needed to deal with the impacts such as natural hazards that we're now facing. Sudden changes, such as the loss of a home, are almost invariably shocking and create a sense of disbelief. How could this be? When can I get back to normal? Surely it won't happen again. So they did research on systemic risks, such as climate change adaptation, and that suggests that this, this disconnect, this cognitive dissonance, is very, very common. Because we expect and hope for stable normality, we find it hard to truly believe the changes that we're seeing will continue. So what adaptation is, is complex. Most people want simplicity. Adaptation is an evolving field and cannot be solely based on historic evidence. What most people want is things they know and have experience of. Um, adaptation is inno inno innovate, inno inno innovate, innovative. Not every solution will work. Most people want solutions that work. 
takes time to get to do adaptation. People want quick fixes. Adaptation is difficult. People want things to be easy. Adaptation is uncertain. People want things to be known. They want security. Adaptation requires large scale social change. People want things to stay the same. Adaptation is questions. People want answers. Okay, there's also a divide between who benefits and who pays. Right, your family trip to Iceland pays off for you in shared memories and good times, but the damage in terms of emissions is spread across the globe over time. Often the damage done has less impact on the people who have done most to cause it, right? So that's the inequality and it erodes the ability of those most at risk to respond. I'm talking about the poorer countries. Adapting to the climate and working to further reduce heating can be an uncomfortable and at times painful process where we have to embrace and acknowledge our grief for the changing world. Lots of people just don't want to do that. The avoidance is the defense mechanism that many, many people use to protect their sanity. They want to avoid potentially dangerous or painful things, especially if they're unfamiliar, but doing that is not safe and it doesn't accomplish action against climate. Okay, so action needs to be collaborative and sustained over longer term and governments are in for short terms, right? So we need to favor the public good over individual vested interest and short term gains. And there's a politicization of action. There's, this is uh, in Australia, you know, an Australian article, but it's in Canada, it's in the US, it's all over the world. You know, they call it, call it the climate wars, if you like. Um, it's polarized opinion and eroded trust in research. And uh, all of this means we can find it surprisingly easy to detach our own daily actions, like driving to work, holidays, watching Netflix, from the broader goals of getting emissions down to zero as soon as possible. So many of us understand the risks of climate change fully, but we don't accept the responsibility and we don't change anything. We feel it's okay not to act, or we may understand and accept the risk, but not have the resources or ability to act. So it's this climate hypocrisy, if you like. Presenting climate change as a problem without a solution or using fear tactics disengages and demotivates us. It can feed anxiety, which undermines action. Okay, so it goes on um, about some of the um, other, some of the problems. Climate change isn't just a problem for scientists, engineers, or governments. We need both large scale and small scale action. As the costs of climate change escalate, we can no longer afford to know about climate change, but not to act, okay? One of the things, if you talk to people about climate change, they shut you down and say, oh, I know, I know how bad it is. I know all about it, right? They shut you down. They have no idea how bad it is. Um, it's one of my pet peeves. So this uh, report was done um, by uh, the Vic in Victoria University in Melbourne, Australia, the problem solution framework on adaptation. I might uh, discuss it in a separate video, innovation um, and adaptation, all about that, how, how, we can, how that pertains and is needed for climate change. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about um, you know, what, what do you do as a homeowner? How do you prepare to lose your home in a climate disaster? So this article came out in early November of last year it's by somebody called Climate Survivor who actually had their house burned down in, in Paradise, California in the so-called campfire. Okay, so let's look at some of the key points and there's, a, there's quite a bit of humor in this. Unless you're living under a rock, most of us aren't that smart to live under rocks. You've probably become aware that climate disasters can happen anywhere and at almost any time. Yes, that means it could happen tomorrow to you. So you should be pre as prepared as you can and particularly prepared for the unthinkable, losing your home. Okay, there's lots of ways to prepare. Like you could build a hermetically sealed underground fallout shelter rated for 2.5 megatons nuclear blast, or you could move to a solar powered cabin in the Canadian tundra. But that's not what he's talking about here, because that's not realistic for the vast majority of us. So he so this is very practical, this article talking about what you can do where you are right now. 
Caveat, I live in a house, so some of this might not apply if you live in an apartment. Okay, um, this guy's wife and he, are they more prepared than most? They had go bags, etc., but they lost their house in the 2018 campfire in Paradise, California, and he's talking about what they did to survive and what you can, you know, basically from learning about what they did, you can hopefully get more preparation in your own life. There used to be a house here. I don't know if this was their house, but you know, this is what was all that was left of houses after that horrendous wildfire went through paradise very, very quickly, killing many, many people. Okay, so the first thing is you need to understand the enemy. Understand your threats. Every place has different climate threats. People often ask me, you know, where should I move to to withstand abrupt climate system change? And it's difficult to know there's many places that are better than other places. It's easier to say where you shouldn't live. So look at the place that you live and look at the threats. You know, is, is there a river close by that can overflow? Are you near a, a wood, woodland that could catch fire and the fire could spread to your neighborhood? Uh, do you get, uh, you know, are you, are you in, a, in a depressed area? Depressed, uh, I'm talking about topo topographically. You know, so that water from torrential rains will collect there and flood your place, right? Every place has different threats. So you need to learn the threats that apply to you and your house and learn what you can do to prepare your home for them and or mitigate them. And if you can't mitigate them, if you live on a floodplain and you get two or three floods in space of five years, well, there's nothing you can do. You should probably move to out of that region to higher ground. Okay, uh, so preparation and understanding the threats can easily mean the difference between having a home to go back to after a climate disaster or not. So in their case, uh, their two main threats are extreme rainfall and wildfires. They're not in a floodplain, but there could be runoff that pools on the upslope side of their house. So they put in a French drain. I put a French drain in my backyard. Um, I dug down and I uh, put... Um, gravel and finer and finer gravel stone dust and flagstone on top so i've got a huge french drain which goes down uh over a foot and can absorb a lot of rainfall i used to get flooding on one side of the house but the french drain uh, anybody can put those in um, it's a really good way to enhance uh, drainage so that you don't get uh, water damage and water flooding into your basement coming from outside um, also, for the, to address the wildfire threat, you can fireproof your home. There's programs for fireproofing your home. One of the things is to clear and trim vegetation around the house. Removed shrubs within six feet of the house, trimmed all the shrubs and trees within 50 feet to break the fuel ladder so that the, nothing can be burned. If there's a fire close to you, it doesn't spread to your, your house, hopefully. Know your escape routes. This is for personal safety. Um, not just one route, every route, have backup routes, like from work to your house, uh, from where your, your spouse works to your house, from your house to schools, etc. Because you never know which route will be flooded or blocked by downed trees or wildfire. Um, and uh, one of the things is uh, about emergency evacuations. There's not a single road on the planet designed to handle a mass evacuation. Roads will back up very, very quickly. Traffic will come to a standstill. You can count on that. It can take hours to travel a few miles during an evacuation, so you need to you know, keep your gas tank pretty full. I'd always been a refill at a quarter tank guy, and now he's a refill at a half a tank guy. So always have, you know, don't let your car run down. Always have fuel in your car. Um, this is a road... This is an Edgewood Lane in Paradise, California, a small street with a single exit. During the Paradise Fire, there was a two mile long line of cars. Five people died in their cars on this street during the fire. So the main thing in an evacuation is to leave early. Don't be some idiot who thinks he's gonna ride it out, then realizes his mistake, leaves too late, and then burns alive. Male pronouns used for fairly obvious reasons. As Soon as you detect a threat, get your pets and go bags and leave. Find a hotel room before they're all full and wait it out. The worst thing that happens is you spend a few nights in a Holiday Inn Express. 
Okay, that's all actually pretty bad, but still, <laughs> see, he's got a great, great sense of humor there. Um, during the camp, uh, during the Paradise Fire, they left fairly early, 9 a.m., but it took them four hours to drive 10 miles. They, they were stuck in flames twice, had severe PTSD. Closest hotel was an hour away. It wasn't worth it. Be the first to leave. You also need a meeting place in case you get separated. One of the funny things about the campfire was that nearly everyone in Paradise had a meeting place, and it was the Walmart in Chico, California, about 10 miles away. So hundreds of people set up camp in the Walmart parking lot, and they waited sometimes for days for family members. Some ended up there for weeks until they were forced out with, of course, nowhere to go. So this is the Walmart parking lot in Chico, uh, part of the encampment after the wildfire in Paradise. Emergency notifications, um, you know, you can get push notifications to you. Uh, you can't count on them working. Uh, they're not, um, they're, there's different types in, depending on the region you're in. I mean, I'm in Canada, and we have an Ontario system. There's a federal system. Uh, in, the, in the U.S., each state has their own different system. Some regions have different systems. You know, it's useful to have a weather radio that you can get warnings. So it's not an integrated system in the U.S. That's one of the biggest problems. They have this code red system in Paradise. It's an opt-in system, but they never got notifications from it. So... And the other thing is insurance. You have to have insurance. Otherwise, if you lose your house, you lose everything, basically. And it's very hard to recover from that. This is a problem for people that are living in regions that are uninsurable. Don't wait for a disaster to happen. Um, if you can't insure your place, uh, you know, you'll, you're, the price will be much lower than you'd hope to sell it for. But at least you can get some money, get out to another place and, you know, start a new life somewhere else. You know, the insurance company ripped them off after they lost their house, but in the end, they got enough to pay off their toxic ash pile um, and to relocate. Rebuild? No. But we do have a home 3,000 miles from our real home, but a roof, but a home with a roof and everything. Without insurance, you'll never even have a chance to recover for most people. Nobody really does a good job of tracking what happens to climate victims. But homelessness in Chico, the nearest city, more than doubled after the campfire. It lasted for several years, those high numbers afterwards, and people that were that suffered and lost everything in the camp in the paradise, uh, you know, the, the, the campfire, it's called the campfire, the paradise fire, they lost everything. They, you know, drove them into homelessness and they really didn't recover. And you know the vast majority of these people had no insurance or not very much insurance. I know insurance is a ripoff, he says. I know that you're not in good hands. I know your insurer is not on your side. I know your insurer is not a good neighbor. And I know that insurance will not make you whole, but without it, you'll have nothing. You'll lose everything except your mortgage payment. You'll be homeless with no money to escape homelessness. You'll be paying 200, 300, 500 per night for hotel rooms out of your own pocket because all the hotel rooms will be booked solid close by. How long can you do that for? So this guy, he knows people who are still living in hotels over a year after the 2017 Tubbs fire. 250 bucks a night, 365 nights, that's 90,000. Who's got that kind of cash? Even if you're paying 5K a year for insurance, that's 18 year of premiums just covering hotel rooms for one year. The only thing worse than having insurance is not having insurance. FEMA won't help you. Only 1% of the people get the maximum amount of FEMA aid, which is only 41,000. Good luck rebuilding on that, and it will take months and months to get it. Even if you're a renter, you need insurance on the on your contents, on your stuff, because it accrues over time, it's costly to replace. And uh, make sure that you understand your insurance, what it covers and what it's not. If you're in a flood prone area, your homeowner's insurance almost certainly does not cover flood damage. You don't want to get into a fight with your insurance over what was flood damage, what was wind damage after a hurricane or derecho. You're going to lose that battle. You're going to, it's going to demoralize and crush you. You need to keep your coverage up to date. Real estate values have gone up dramatically, so you need to check that your coverage is sufficient. 
Um, also know the contents. When you lose everything in a climate disaster, especially a wildfire where nothing recognizable may be left, your insurance company may require you to provide a complete list of all the contents of your home down to the toothpick. It sounds insane, but it happened to them. Some insurers don't require that, but you know, a lot of them do. So you don't want to be sifting through the rubble, making a list of what you had in your house. Okay, you should do the contents inventory beforehand. He recommends every New Year's Day, just go through the entire house and garage and take a picture of everything. Right? Don't just keep it on your computer, which will be melted in the fire, any wildfire, you know, load it up to the cloud so that if you lose everything in your house, you have this um, open every drawer, every cabinet, every closet, the fridge, take a picture. Take pictures of every room, the furniture rugs, stuff on the walls, everything. Make sure the photos are stored in the cloud. Um, it's no good if they're on your computer and it's washed away in a flood or burned in a fire. And, uh, you know, you get a, why New Year's Day? Well, it's a holiday. You're going to be at home, either nursing a hangover or watching football games, or maybe both. So just go around and take pictures of everything. Because you, you also got a whole bunch of useless crap. For Christmas so go ahead and uh, take pictures of everything right and then you and, and have go bags and uh, you know stuff for pets food for pets uh, documentation most people in the campfire many people they not only lost all their possessions but everything from their driver's license to their insurance policy to the deed for their home paper burns surprisingly well who knew but seriously, some people didn't even remember who their insurer was and had no way to find out. At the disaster recovery center set up in Chico after the fire, the line of people to replace their IDs and social security cards stretched out the door. Right? You don't want to be in that line. So you've got to take digital copies of everything, especially your deed and insurance. Now, they have a safe deposit box at a bank for important hard copies. But every, they keep copies of everything in the cloud, insurance policy, deed, trust, wills, copies of licenses, everything that you need when there's an emergency that you're going to lose, possibly have a copy in the cloud in a secure place. You know, some people say, well, I have a document safe in the garage. Well, document safes are literally worthless. They had one in the corner of their garage. When they finally got it opened, it was warped by the heat. It was completely empty. Literally everything inside had vaporized. Most document safes are rated for 1700 Fahrenheit for one hour. His wife had two jade bracelets that melted in the fire. Jade melts at about 2300 Fahrenheit. Of course, a house is burned for hours and hours and hours. So document safes are worthless. Don't waste your money. Instead, spend it on secure cloud storage. And, uh, you know, other stuff. So this article is focusing mostly on preparing to lose your home to a climate disaster. But there are a thousand other things to do to prepare for circumstances that don't require an evacuation and don't destroy your home. Okay, so anyway, th this is, um, yeah, this is really practical, useful information from a wildfire survivor who lived in Paradise, California and lost everything. You know, so what you could do what he you know so you know he's a humorous writer he talks about preparation that he did before the fire and about additional preparation that he did after the fire and there's lots of practical advice that homeowners should uh, think about okay so anyway food for thought um this so since uh you know there should be two billion people on the planet that are doing this sort of thing right because uh they're prepared they're expecting to lose their homes right at some point so are they doing all this preparation so that they can recover when they do you know if those expectations come to fruition anyway very interesting stuff very practical stuff could be very important stuff life-changing stuff for some people um please consider going to my website paulbeckwith.net and donating to support my research and videos um donate to my paypal account to support my research and videos and I guess I should, uh, well, I missed this New Year's to do a content inventory. So I guess I guess I should do it maybe next New Year's or maybe I should do it uh, tomorrow. Anyway, thanks again for listening and uh, bye for now.